All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. So, um, so I wanted to mention that um, after our final session, there will be an opportunity for questions. And I sort of get the sense from this audience that there's this electricity of people who have lots of questions <laughs> that they want answered. And so we thought it would be perfectly fitting to have all of our panelists uh, here to try to speak to the questions that you might have. But before we do that, our final session entitled Pocahontas Legacy, Myths, Realities, and Relevance is intended to look at the past, present, and future of the Pocahontas story. So as such, we've invited all of our panelists to offer their thoughts on the subject. So I'm so pleased that Chief Ken Adams has agreed to serve as moderator for this part of our conversation. Chief Adams is Emeritus Chief of the Upper Mattapani Tribe, serving as chief from 2001 to 2016. From the early beginnings of the effort, he worked consistently for federal recognition of six of Virginia's tribes, which culminated in success in January of 2018. During Ken's tenure as chief, he also served as chairman of the Board of Trustees of Bacon College, which has a primary goal of educating Native Americans. Also, Chief Adams initiated a process in 2009 to establish a tribute to Virginia Indians. The mantle was completed on Capitol Square in the spring of 2018 as a tribute and memorial to Virginia Indians, and I encourage you all to go and enjoy that the next time you're downtown in Richmond. So now I'll turn the floor over to Chief Adams. Um, who will try to understand the legacy, myths, realities, and relevance of Pocahontas. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate your, those remarks and a warm welcome. Uh, I would like to offer a brief statement uh, that I've produced to share with you concerning this specific event. For me, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you to discuss the life, the legend, and legacy of Pocahontas a Virginia Indian woman who has become one of the most well-known people in all of American history. Since her time on this earth, it, is, it became unfortunate that her relations, her descendants, and her people became some of the most mistreated in American history. Thankfully, in the words of Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, <coughs> times they are changing. <laughs> We all wonder, and we can wonder out loud and wonder to ourselves, how she would have felt 400 years ago had she known the truth of today. If she were here today, what could she or what would she say to our distinguished guests? My hope is that she would find some solace and peace in the words we say this afternoon. And truly, we need to dedicate this time with Pocahontas to peace and reconciliation. The, the panel that we're gonna discuss this afternoon is concerning her legacy, her myths, realities of her life, and relevance of her life. Each panelist will be provided a brief opportunity to share their individual opinions on these thoughts the legacy, the myths, the realities, and relevance. And I'm welcoming these guests once again to the stage. They've been introduced to you before, so I'll dispense with the introductions. And I'm gonna ask Brother Chris if he would uh, elaborate on his thoughts concerning <clears throat> the legacy, the myths, the realities, and the relevance of Pocahontas. A big subject. <laughs> a very big subject indeed, but I, I think I'd want to start by saying how much I appreciate your words about the importance of peace and reconciliation in this world and as a legacy of Pocahontas. I, I mentioned that in what I said earlier, um, and I do mean it, and I think that if any of us can work in that way to understand more about what it is to have a world 
uh, that is dedicated to peace and reconciliation, then that is a good thing. The other thing I think about is that um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a, a commemoration for the 400th anniversary of the execution of Sir Walter Rawley. And mm. I think that one of the things about people who become legends and whose stories last for so many centuries is that we do see them in quite stark terms. We see them in shades of black and white. I think I, and I use that as a, an illustration that um, Pocahontas was the one who saved John Smith. Sir Walter Raleigh was the one who removed his cloak and put it down so that Queen Elizabeth could walk over it. We remember that, but I think that it's occasions like we had at St Margaret's Church in Westminster and occasions like this when we can try to get beyond that and try to get beneath the surface to find out much more. And I think that that's something that we've <coughs> done from different points of view this afternoon, and I hope that that's something that will continue. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Anne, uh, coming forward to you, uh, what, do you, what can you share with us on these four elements, the legacy, the myths, the realities, and the relevance of Pocahontas? Well, I think uh, her legacy um, is the United States of America um, and the people that she left here, her people that she left here, um, and the people that she went to in England. She was a peacemaker and was, she was an ambassador. Whether she meant to be one or not, we don't know. But the fact that she was sent to the colony to bring food and various things showed that there was a compassion in her. Um, whether she ever saved John Smith's life or not, we don't know. But there were accounts of these things, and so I've, I feel that she had compassion for people, that she was generous. And that gives us a, a picture of her character trait uh, that I'm very proud of, personally. Her, her myths, there have been many. And like Disney, who is, you know, what I consider to be, they have defamed her name. Um, for the people who needed to know her the most, and that's children, and I'm very grieved about that. But her reality would have been she was the daughter of a chief that was his favorite, beloved daughter. And as the daughter of a chief, I could relate to that. Uh, I was a daddy's girl, and apparently she was too. <laughs> and um, we would have followed daddy everywhere, and he would have been our hero. And we would have learned and absorbed so much of our history and culture and tradition through that interaction, which I think she did. Um, so I think that you know her legacy is that the people that she left here, the country that was birthed out of her relationship, whether it was something that she decided to do or not, and the people on the other side of the pond who uh, share in that and love her and honor her to this day. The fact that we're sitting here in this auditorium with a packed house to learn about who she is speaks volumes about who she was and who we see her as today. I hope that this will spur other projects like this, that generations behind us will get to know her in a more personal manner than the black and white picture that we've told about in history books and re the record. Thank you, Chief Ann. I, <clears throat> it was many, many years ago uh, at a session that we were talking ab about the history of Virginia and the history of Virginia Indians. And I was listening to Chief Ann speak, and she indicated the 400-year history that we were involved in, the 400-year history. And one of the remarks she made has stuck with me all these years. She indicated that at that time, the beginning of this century, we, the Virginia Indians and the Indians of America, were in our exodus. And I think Pocahontas is a big part of that exodus. I, for one, am proud to be associated 
with Pocahontas in so many ways. Uh, John? Sure. Um, you know, every day, every day at my site, we, uh, we tackle this. You know, we have people come into uh, Reverend Whitaker's reconstructed house called uh, Rock Hall, um, and they bring all of these, these myths and these legacies into question form. Um, and a lot of times, yeah, we have to deconstruct things to rebuild a little bit. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's something that really sticks with me. And I, I, I think about films, and I think about productions like The New World, and I think about Disney. And the responsibility we have to, to better speak on behalf of our, our society, all of our people, that we need, we need them to do a better job. All right, the film community needs to do a better job. Documentaries, they can do what they do and they probably do a better job than the big films, obviously. Um, but it's all of us. We have to let that market know, um, clearly. Um, but the other thing with that is we also have to kind of step up a little bit and people who we talk to on an everyday basis who might not know the story, just give them some basic ideas of what really took place. And those basic things are not hard to find. You know, I always tell people, you, all these letters that Dale wrote, Whitaker, I mean, they're all on Google, Whitaker letter, Dale letter, you know, John Rolfe to Dale to Mary Pocahontas. Just start doing that. Um, but, you know, on the, on the bigger side of this, uh, the bigger legacy side, uh, I pose this to most of my visitors. I, I say, you know, we, we, we throw names around, you know, founding fathers, founding mothers, and all this. You know, and I question, I question the terms, and I say, well, look, if you could trace one, one woman back to the growth of this land, who would you put? Um, Martha Washington, I mean, who, who is it? And I, I, I get back to Pocahontas because I say, look, Pocahontas is there, she's pretty much sacrificing pretty much anything that she, she once knew in some ways, but she's challenged with the idea of becoming English and she could have walked away from that, she could have run away, she could have done a lot of things that um, went against what we know is the, the eventual happenings. But I ask this question, if Pocahontas did not marry Rolf, how would tobacco have flourished? You can't have a tobacco economy when you're constantly at war. It's just not happening. So if you don't have the tobacco economy, how are the investors happy? The investors aren't happy. If the investors aren't happy in the Virginia company, they're gonna pull up stakes and go home. And if they pull up stakes and go home, King James is not gonna give another charter because this one would have embarrassed him that he signed off on. If he's embarrassed the Virginia company, he's certainly not gonna give the next charter to the people he despises, which is the Plymouth Company Pilgrims. <laughs> it's not. I don't see that happening. I don't see him going, surely, yeah, go fail for me again. So if the Plymouth Company is not going and you don't have Massachusetts formed, you don't have Virginia formed, you don't have Adams, you don't have Jefferson, you don't have the, the families that come here that eventually create the United States. So it's all symbiotic. Everything is intertwined. And that brings me to another part and the final part of this legacy. I wish I had, I had more time, but, and that is, if Pocahontas perhaps is a founding mother, right? Um, that's very complex. It's so complex. Um, and perhaps we, our society today, uh, it seems like we argue over things as if they're black and white. And they're not. Uh, this period is not, Pocahontas' story is not. It's gray, it's all gray. There's something in the middle. It's not all what the Powhatans did or the English did. There's something that existed in the middle and that's part of the stuff we don't know about. Um, and that complexity is Pocahontas. So when we're presenting this story, and I know a lot of people who come to my site, they want an answer from me. My answer and the, my staff's answer is usually we don't know. That's probably the legacy. It, so part of that legacy is we need to be humble enough to say we don't know. And in that not knowing, we need to try and endeavor to find out more. And probably 400 years from now, this panel is going to be up, well, not us exactly. <laughs> but we'll probably have another panel that's going to be probably tackling these same issues. Um, so maybe in the next 400 years, we answer five more questions that weren't answered before. So that is perhaps for me as a public history person, uh, a, a, an eventual legacy, which is how many more answers can we find on this story? Thank you, John. Those are some very provocative remarks. And I have uh, two distinguished people, one on my right, one on my left, that I'm going to uh, 
throw a more specific provocative remark to them. Just these two, and if the others would like to join in the conversation, they're certainly welcome to. And, and it's about the reality and relevance of Pocahontas today. And I want you to think about, this, is a, uh, this could be a tough question for all of us. Uh, how does it uh, play out in the public arena when our president uses the word Pocahontas in a disparaging way? <laughs> well. Okay, I'm, I'm <laughs> You know, I worked at a. What were you saying, Andy? I, I worked in the <laughs> private sector for 40 plus years, and, and the folks there would see me come and say, "Hi, chief." Mm -hmm. I wasn't a chief. I, I just wasn't a chief. Now that I am a chief, it's okay <laughs> to, to <laughs> use that appellation. And, and I saw lots of females who were called Pocahontas. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pocahontas is not a pejorative term. Uh, it's not a term that should be used um, in, in, in anything less than a tasteful manner. So uh, I would implore you <laughs> uh, to, to not bandy around a title like that. And if you don't know the name of an Indian maiden or an Indian woman or an Indian male, uh, ask. Don't call them Chief or Pocahontas. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it. Um, since we've now are in Massachusetts, um, and um, Senator Warren is our senator, um, it, it's really kind of hurtful and inappropriate, and lots of other things. Yeah. But what strikes me always is that contrast with what we do know about Pocahontas, which was she, however she did it, represented her people in a way of hospitality, mm -hmm. a way of invitation. She's, you know, whether or not she saved John Smith's life or not, whether it was her bringing food or her father sending food, she was living out what we know to be Native values, mm -hmm. which are that of welcome. And nobody comes into your house without being offered something to eat or to be f you know, fed, giving something to drink. That's just how we're, we're brought up. And so for me, it's her legacy is the, just the opposite of that kind of pejorative behavior and is actually the, um, what we as Native people know to be who we are, which is those who invite and welcome and make room for and, and, and um, don't judge people by just their, you know, their first presence kind of thing. Um, and that living curiosity. And the sad part of where we are right now, as you have said, is this um, divide of you have to take a side, you have to do this. We're all much more mixed up and much more complicated than we're given credit for. And Native people particularly are um, often seen, we're often seen as, you know, um, either having no sense of humor um, or depending on where you live, you know, um, not being able to keep it. I mean, all of the pejorative things yeah. that go along with our identities um, have nothing to do with our realities. And I think that's one of the things we're talking about Pocahontas for is because n none of what the, the non-native storytellers have told have anything to do with her reality. So. Or our realities. Right. So. Well, uh, thank you for elaborating on that and sharing your opinion. Right. And I'm going <clears throat> to shift back just a okay. little bit to the other parts of the discussion, the uh, myths and the true legacy of Pocahontas, mm -hmm. if you would. Well, I think her legacy is that legacy of um, what we're seeing now with our Native women, if I can just take this on. Um, jumping into the fray, being willing to, to say, okay, we are where we are, but let's 
let's try to move towards peace and reconciliation. Let's try to do, take care of our children. Let's try to take care of our elders. Let's do the work that it costs and spend the money that it costs to get involved in those kinds of things. And I mean, I think her legacy has encouraged, um, and at least in me, encouraged the, the compassion and the orientation towards um, doing good for all people, not just our children or our tiny communities or our big communities, but for all people that we are not willing to let anybody um, suffer, including those people who are coming to our borders. Right. Thank you. Brother but, Steve. But Chief Adams, I, I, uh, when I think about, <coughs> about that legacy, I look at the dichotomy mm. uh, around Captain John Smith. On the one side, you know, he had, he had help from the Indian people with the great cartography he did, the, the maps that he drew, and, and they've endured to this day, give a lot of credence to that. And the relationship with uh, Pocahontas, we completely cast it aside. So I'm saying somewhere in, in his storytelling, there, have to be, there has to be some kernel of truth. I don't know what that is, but as I look at her legacy, the first thing I say, whether it's full of myths or realities, whatever, it has been enduring. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say the, the positive aspects of those uh, uh, within that legacy will continue to endure, regardless of how she got where she was. Whether, uh, and I think she was kidnapped. I think she said, here I am. It is what it is. What do I do with it? And I think she made a conscious decision to the best of her ability to do what she could to elevate the status the stock and trade of her people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as opposed to where she was in England. I want you to know that my people are not heathens, they're not savages, and that the religion they practice, while you call it pagan, to them it's a way of life. And by the way, it's close, it closely approximates this Judeo-Christian religion that you embrace. Mm. So, so I, you know, I've got to believe she, she was able to articulate those viewpoints uh, and I do think that uh, she did serve as, as, as that cross-cultural ambassador. And I think that exists today, which was evidenced by the reception we received in England. Mm. And this lady I met at Berkeley Plantation two weeks ago. Well, I know Pocahontas. We love her. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, folks, I felt that love when I was in England. Uh, so uh, some of the myths, they're there. Uh, you know, I've heard some myths about me that... <laughs> Let's not go there. Uh, they kind of complimented me, so I didn't challenge them. <laughs> Those other myths, I said, no, 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 that's not me. Uh, and that's kind of who we are, but, but, but there are some realities in her life that, that evidence themselves that kind of come up uh, as we move ahead that point to, the, to that very pivotal role that she played um, in, in bringing those cultures together. And then once, one disclaimer to the gentle lady that uh, asked the question about uh, the matrilineal question. I gave you a great answer, but the answer I gave wasn't to that question. <laughs> I gave you an answer about matriarchal, so I, I apologize. <laughs> so uh, I was in school once and the professor said, uh, Steve, that was a great answer, but I wish you would have answered the question I asked. <laughs> I, I haven't grown up from that. So to sum it up, they're, they're myths, but they're enduring realities. Her legacy <coughs> is, is both inspiring and heart-wrenching mm -hmm. for a child of that age to be taken from those environs in which she grew to be accustomed, albeit you know, through the tender age of 14. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the legacies. It's heart-wrenching and also uh, very heartwarming to, to see that she uh, evolved the way she did. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Bill, you well, have plenty of time. <laughs> well, you better not tell me that. <laughs> what I can talk about is the legend of Pocahontas, my, my favorite subject. And what I want to try to do is to explain to you how we got to where we are today. Mm. You've already had references already have been made to the two major statements about Pocahontas in our time in the last 25 years, the two motion pictures, the Walt Disney cartoon and the New World uh, motion picture. And in both of those, 
uh, Pocahontas is presented as, as beautiful, as a person who loved and saved the handsome John Smith from execution by a father, and as an environmentalist. <laughs> and she probably was beautiful. Uh, I always think of that uh, statement that John Smith recorded where an acquaintance in, in um, London admitted that he had, he had, quote, seen many English ladies worse favored, proportioned, and behavior. <laughs> so what I want to do, I want to point to four major developments that happened in the, in the centuries since her death uh, that shaped and got us to where we are today. Mm. And not much happened in the, in the 1600s after her death. And in 1705, Robert Beverly wrote his history of Virginia, and he told everything that John Smith recorded. So we were all right with all of that at that point. And, and, and Beverly's book was popular, um, even, in, even in New England, um, because a New England schoolgirl did a portrait of her that has survived, and, and, he, and, and it shows her as the ideal woman. She was somebody to be admired because of her goodness. Um, New Englanders loved her then. They hated her at the time of the Civil War. That's why I mentioned that part. Uh, later in the 1700s, travel literature gets her story out there. Um, there be, and some maps have her, a vignette of, of, her, of an episode in her life on the map, like as a French map of 1739. Um, and related to that is, is, is this first major development. And it's an idea that's still with us. And it's the European theory of the virtue of natural man. Um, the idea which the, which the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau has famously put into writing, the idea that, that a simple society that is immersed in the beauty and innocence of nature is more virtuous than the corrupt urban societies of Europe and England. And explorers in the 1760s found a society like that that seemed to confirm that theory. Mm. And the story of Pocahontas seemed to confirm that theory. And so that idea of the virtue of natural man got linked to Pocahontas. Um, that's, you see that in those two films. Uh, the 19th century saw the greatest dissemination of, of the Pocahontas legend. There were dozens of portraitists and history painters who presented her as beautiful and glamorized her story, and her image appeared everywhere. It appeared on, on advertisements for tobacco and medicine, and boats were named after her, which were towns and cities, even horses. Um, and, the, first, the second major development started right at the beginning of the century in 1803, when an English expatriate novelist named John Davis wrote the first of his three books in which he took, he took the story of Pocahontas and expanded it in, into a full novel. Um, America's, America had a history by then, it was albeit a short history, and Pocahontas was a star of that history, and so her story was developed by novelists and, and by a number of playwrights, and John Davis, um, made the most significant addition to the Pocahontas narrative of all time in that he added the element of romance. And he said that the 12 or 13-year-old Pocahontas falls in love with the, with the 27-year-old handsome John Smith, and that's why she saved him. So that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it's, it's, unbe it's an unbelievable notion that Indian girls immediately fall in love with the first young Caucasian male they see. <laughs> But, but this storyline emerged in a number of novels of this period. The most famous of them is Chateaubriand's Attila, in which the same story is told. A beautiful young maiden saves from execution by her father the man who she's in love with. And, and Attila, um, it had an immense impact on the early Romantic movement in, Eng in Europe and America. It went through five editions um, in its first year. It was translated into multiple languages. So, all right, the, the, the third development, we jump to the time of the Civil War, when sectionalist historians in New England uh, seized on the Pocahontas story as a target. It was an easy target, uh, because she had married interracially, and yet she was cherished by a horribly racist slaveholding society. And she, and, uh, she was the ancestor of literally thousands of descendants um, who were slaveholding planters. And they claimed her. And um, as John was alluding to earlier, she was considered the, the, um, the mother of Virginia, just like George Washington was the mother, uh, George Washington was the father of his country. She was, her, she was revered. Her story provided a unique history for the South that, uh, that three New England historians decided uh, they, were, they wanted to discredit it, particularly the rescue story. 
And uh, one of them, John Galton Palfrey, told Henry Adams that an attack on Smith's relations with Pocahontas would, quote, break as much glass as any other stone that can be thrown, end quote. And in an article that Henry Adams wrote uh, right after the war in 1867 in the North American Review, he portrayed Smith as an irresponsible liar. Um, and, and those Northern historians were remarkably successful. They cast serious doubt as to whether a rescue ever took place. Previously, no one had doubted the rescue story. Um, and once you establish doubt, it's slow for that to go away. Yeah. Well, the Civil War uh, changed perceptions about Pocahontas. Um, and that change brought about the, f the fourth major development I want to mention. Um, white Virginians became intensely racist. Their racism caused problems for not only the freed, newly freed African Americans, but also the, the Indians and the Pocahontas story. Um, and the best example of this is in 1906, um, for, to commemorate the tercentennial of the Jamestown founding the next year. Um, a sculpture of her was planned, um, the one that's there at Jamestown today and, the, and also at Gravesend. A major American sculptor, William R. Dre Partridge, was commissioned for it, but it took 16 years to get enough money to pay for it. And the reason was that um, white, many white Virginians were no longer sure what they thought about Pocahontas. Uh, one APV leader, Sarah Rice Pryor, who claimed, proudly claimed that Pocahontas was her ancestor, yet she said that Pocahontas, quote, con conquered every instinct in her savage nature. And she left us with this unforgettable quote, like the lovely pond lily, her root was in slime, but at the first touch of the sun, English civilization, <laughs> the golden heart was revealed of a perfect flower. Wow. Wow. Well, <laughs> that, that hatred, the injustice of that era, is what brought about the reaction that we have today, which I could call a fifth major development, but it's really just a <laughs> rebirth of the first and second ones that we see in those two, two films. Both of them emphasize the natural world is beautiful and restorative. Um, they, they resurrect the 18th, theory, 18th century theory of the virtue of natural man. And both films present the now standard episodes. A beautiful Pocahontas rescues John Smith, who tends to be a lot younger and handsomer than his real life portrait. <laughs> <laughs> and is in love with Smith. And, 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 and she saves the struggling Jamestown colony, just as John Davis told the story in 1803 in his Captain Smith and Pocahontas, an Indian mm -hmm. tale. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> That was some uh, great stuff you told us there. <laughs> <laughs> Helen? This is going to be much shorter and a complete change of pace. <laughs> well, I'm the oddball on the panel. <laughs> I was trained as a cultural anthropologist, not an archaeologist. I work with living people. I don't dig up dead ones. <laughs> and I found myself doing an awful lot of writing of history stuff. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> So an awful lot of people think I'm a historian. I'm still, to the core, a cultural anthropologist. And I did my first field work with people on the Duck Valley Shoshone Paiute Reservation yeah. out in Nevada. And the work was in linguistics. So right after that, I first became acquainted with living Virginia Indians. Now, I grew up with the same myths as everybody around me in the Hampton Roads area. And they were, in their way, just as inaccurate and just as potentially misleading as the mythology of Pocahontas that I had grown up with. However, I did notice, at the time, the mythology couldn't really hurt Pocahontas herself. It could mislead people. It could lead to all sorts of things that we've been hearing about them. But the mythology about the modern people, because they contrasted so with the myths about Pocahontas, they were really damaging to the modern people. The modern people were going through hell. And when they tell you the times were rough, they're not exaggerating, because I went out and documented it for them. That's what Pocahontas' people does. I was also told by the modern people, you can't begin to understand us now unless you can connect us all the way back and see why these things were going on. Even if we don't remember the details anymore, stuff happened, and we'd like to know, too. We need the connection made. And of course, that took a lot of years. But I found myself dealing with a lot of myth-holding 20th century Virginians. 
and in many cases, not coming to fisticuffs, I'm not big enough, <laughs> but getting into arguments. So I managed to do the hooking up and the describing of the modern people and very gradually run, won their trust. And then I found, I began trying to write up books and they were early culture and the history, which were salable. I couldn't get published for 20 years because the credibility of all Algonquian speakers on the East Coast was so low that publishers and university presses would not take them on. Mm -hmm. And once I did find a university press, Oklahoma, it took me eight years to get the first book out from them. And we almost had a lawsuit in the process. So the mythology about Native Americans in this region, the modern ones, affected me. It affected anybody who came in contact with them. It could also get you the cold shoulder in some of the counties, and I found that out firsthand. So to get back to Pocahontas and the comparison there, in the work I have been doing, I have been trying to promote, let's just say politely, accuracy. I can think of a number of obscene ways to phrase it that would satisfy me more. <laughs> but accuracy. I wanted more accuracy in the understanding of the Indians' old way of life. It wasn't savage. It wasn't a lot of other things. Above all, what it was was very, very ingenious mm -hmm. about using the things they had at hand. I, I've never gotten over uh, not being surprised, but just being delighted by little things coming out. And yeah, of course, it's a logical way to do it. It may look like a flimsy house, but it'll hold up better in a hurricane than an English one will. It also won't burn down, mm -hmm. things like that. And I also wanted accuracy about the modern people. Two different kinds of accuracy, two different eras. But it was, above all, the accuracy for the modern people and getting people to see them as human and adaptive human beings that has been driving my work, all of my work, right along. Because I still work with the modern people. Thank Next. You, <laughs> Chief Gray. I, uh, basically, you know, I, I have to come at it from the perspective of our tribe and our people. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to cover first with a couple things that uh, Chief Adams has said. Legacy, I think her legacy is exhibited right here, mm -hmm. just the sheer interest in Pocahontas uh, in her uh, few years on this earth and the century since then and what she's meant. Mm -hmm. um, I saw it uh, last year, I had, uh, attended an academic conference uh, hosted by the British Library and ran about, I think about three, four days and I'll tell you what, I could not believe how many ways academics could dissect the story of Pocahontas. <laughs> I heard things that I was like, wow, where did someone come up with this? And we're, we're talking scholars from Japan, Germany, all over the world. And I was amazed. And I was one of the final speakers. And uh, I got up and said, OK, I basically acknowledge she means a lot to everything, but she doesn't really mean a whole lot to the Pamunkey people. <laughs> and that, that got everyone's attention, so I had everyone's <laughs> attention for the next 20 minutes or so while I spoke. Uh, now, as far as the myth, uh, even the Pamunkey people embraced the myth. In the 18th and 19th century, uh, Pamunkey people were living on our current reservation, uh, which is just a fragment of what our land mass once was. Five. And we were constantly, okay. uh, well, periodically dealing with uh, trouble from our white neighbors. They were trying to take our land. Mm. To the point that when the Civil War came about, we were Union loyalists. We figured we'd be better off with the Union winning than the, the South. Mm. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, as has been discussed, uh, rampant racial policies, discrimination, the, the Jim Crow laws and such that were affecting all Virginia natives, uh, including the Pamunkey people. Uh, but we also saw an interest in Pocahontas. So our people did a pretty logical thing. They said, hey, we're going to play this Pocahontas story and play it up. We're going to play Indian. 
And in about the uh, 1880s, uh, our people formed a play group known as the Pamunkey Players that would tour around, throughout Virginia and around the country. And one of their primary plays was the reenactment of Pocahontas Rescue and John Smith. Uh, a famous showing of that was at the Jamestown Exposition in 1907. Mm. There's a famous stereo view uh, photograph of that. Uh, I had to go out on eBay, buy the card, and then I had to buy the antique stereo viewer <laughs> <laughs> to see it, just to see it the way it is. And if anyone doesn't know it, it's like the, uh, what do they call those things? Viewmaster. 3D? You're the Viewmaster, you see in 3D, this photograph. And, and we played that, uh, basically trying to get white Virginians to see the Pamunkey people as the people of Pocahontas. Please stop all this racial issues. We were fighting, you know, riding in the backs of trains, uh, being uh, drafted into black regiments in World War I. Uh, and, and we were fighting that. At the same time, we had uh, tribal leaders like uh, Chief George Major Cook in the Virginia General Assembly fighting for us. Mm. So basically fighting two fronts, directly with Virginia politicians and on the side trying to sway public opinion. We discussed the Racial Integrity Act, 1924. That came along, we were fighting that. Uh, and that was based on a, um, a general principle that's been in existence for centuries known as the one drop rule. Mm -hmm. If you have one drop of African American or Native American blood, you are African American, Native American. Um, now Virginia Racial Integrity Act, they were subdividing the population into two categories, white with all the privileges that gets and colored, all the stigma and discrimination that gets. But what happened is the Virginia elite that was so proud of their descendancy from Pocahontas, they argued they, they didn't want to be rated as colored. <laughs> so they carved an exception into the amendment for a certain percentage of Native American blood that would still keep you as white, <laughs> just to satisfy the Virginia elite. I would say at that point, the Pamunkey people said, what's the point of carrying on this play? Here we are, the people of po Pocahontas, and we're being discriminated against, we're being considered colored and everything else, and these people just have a minor percentage and they still get all the benefits. Mm. So by the late 1920s, 1930s, the Pamunkey Players Group just kind of dissolved, and our people just put head to the ground and weathered the racial policies that existed in Virginia for decades to come. Mm -hmm. It was just something we had to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so during that time period, I'd say uh, as a kid, I, I didn't grow up on a reservation, but would always be down there as a kid in the uh, 60s. The Pamunkey Indian Baptist Church always had a uh, photograph of Pocahontas on its walls, but it wasn't a, a major deal. Uh, as we're coming along, we come up to the, a few years ago, there was the 100th anniversary of uh, the wedding between Pocahontas and John Rolfe. Uh, and there was a reenactment re down at Jamestown where a Pamunkey woman portrayed Pocahontas at that wedding. Mm -hmm. And it was said at the time that there was more Pamunkey there in Jamestown than had been in the last 400 years. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to give a little plug here, uh, and I have to correct uh, Chief Atkins. Uh, plug for the Pocahontas Reframe Film Festival. It's not a Pamunkey endeavor. Our assistant chief, Brad Brown, has taken it on as his own personal project uh, with friends he has from the French Film Festival and such. Uh, I was in the, uh, one of the first meetings we had on that film festival, and we were trying to come up with a name. And I, I jokingly say it took about all day to come up with it. I've heard it was more two to three hours, but uh, one of the first things that was tossed out, Pocahontas Film Festival. And I sat there and said, nah, uh, hell no. <laughs> I, there was no way. I, I just thought it was just, it, it, it just didn't work. We talked it over, come up with other wild names, 
And we kept drifting back to Pocahontas in some way. Somebody, I can't remember who, came up with the term Pocahontas reframed. And they explained the reasoning, <laughs> and my opinion immediately changed. We see Pocahontas as the first Native American to have her story just mistold. Uh, the myths, all these years, just everything has been wrong. And that has carried over to other Native Americans, mm -hmm. the Native American story. Mm -hmm. The film festival was intended to, sh to showcase films by Native Americans telling their own story. And that was the genesis of the Pocahontas reframe. We were reframing the telling of Native American stories. And then at that point, okay, little PR glitch, yeah, the Pocahontas is a good hook. It gets people in. That's fine. But the Pocahontas reframe, we, uh, we all agree that uh, that worked very well. It's not a film festival about Pocahontas. It's meant to showcase Native Americans telling their own stories. So. Final plug, if you get a chance this weekend, stop by the Bird Theater and check out the uh, film festival. And Chief Gray, what you said is, is very significant. If, if we as Native people want our story told, we have to tell it. And, and, and that narrative uh, didn't begin today, but it's, it's kicking into high gear. And I would challenge you, if you're interested in the story of Virginia Indians, if you're interested in social studies, then call your legislator, because in Virginia, Social studies has suddenly taken the backstage. The, the SOLs that were, were, were ascribed to or assigned to social studies have evaporated and they've been switched to STEM. But if you don't know your history, mm -hmm. you'll have a hard time plotting your future, mm -hmm. planning your future. So please contact your legislators and say, enough is enough, folks. We want social studies to be in that position that it ought to be so people can hear about their respective histories. Not the single narrative that we've grown up with in Virginia. Thanks to all for the presentations. We do have time for our Q&A session. So uh, any folks in the audience that would like to ask questions of anyone here or any specific questions? Yes, ma'am. I'll, you know, I don't want to select. <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, I guess how difficult would it be? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, let me answer that if I may, and I'll let, let someone else talk about it. You know, there was some discussion a few years ago about bringing those remains. <laughs> I think it was uh, one of those guys from uh, uh, Nevada. Yeah. Uh, Wayne, Wayne Newton. Newton. Wayne Newton. He, yeah, but he, that was the only one that I've ever heard that say that we should bring those remains back. And I'm, for one, totally opposed to it personally. Me too. But I think Me too. most people are, because she's been resting there for 400 years. Yeah. I mean, and she's uh, in a place of honor. This, yes. And if she had been brought back here, she would not have been honored in her own land. But the reality is we don't know where the remains are. That's right. So. Specifically, we know it's good. in the church. We know the general area, but but not the specifics. Okay. Any, any comments from you, Chris? I have no more to add to what my colleagues have said. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Question here. What I've heard today, I keep coming back to the story of E.T. and this young child with an open heart and um, a curiosity that hasn't been snuffed out yet. That seems to be the feeling I'm coming away with of the very young Pocahontas. In light of the current Me Too movement, I keep thinking about this lovely young woman, intelligent young woman, who it sounds to me was manipulated. I just wondered if any of you have, I mean, particularly with the stories that then developed, um, any comments about that? Well said. Well, you can't fire John Smith. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, it, anybody who's a captive has got to be manipulated, okay? I mean, once you're captive, you're not, you don't have any choices. Um, so none of us know what the exact history was. Um, 
and we can't go back and punish people. <laughs> um, but I'm, you know, my concern is that she's not, um, she's either a um, sex object or, or, you know, I mean, all of the things that have been written oftentimes are romanticized things, um, take away from the reality of a curious child engaging and young woman, an intelligent young woman, engaging in beginning to understand the complexity of the world as her people were trying to understand the complexity of the world, as were the people, you know, they were all thrown into a dangerous situation that none of them had any real tools necessarily to deal with. Um, they thought they did, um, and yet, so you know, all of the politics that was going on, all of the um, strict religious education, all of, I mean, all of the attempts to try to control an environment that was rapidly changing um, gets us into that place of not knowing exactly how to view any of that. So, you know, I, I've been married 40 years, 42 years, and uh, you know, my wife has manipulated me to the point of. <laughs> You know, you know, I, I think I'm head of the household, and, and you know, and I'm sad, dumb, and happy. Life is good. I think I've a, um, I'm a. Go ahead, right here, please, and I'll I'll get you back there, okay? I may not need that, so, but it's okay. Um, I just have had a question since childhood about the myth which has always seemed to me to be a myth uh, for a lot parts of it. Um, why would a young mother willingly leave her child in England? What could have been important enough for her to get on a boat that now oh. seems was full of pestilence and leave her child there? Was it coercion from her husband? Um, she didn't leave it there. She brought the child on the she boat? She was bringing the child back to Virginia okay. along with her husband. Okay, that's good to know and that. And then the poor soul died. Mm -hmm. and, so the child and nobody died. on board was able to take care of him because they were sick as dogs too. So they brought it back. So John Rolfe handed young Thomas off to his brother uh -huh. so that the child would be cared for at all. And, it grew and up that's in why England. young Thomas stayed in England. Well, the other observation I have is if, is, as I understand it, Smith's Fort sits on the land that was her dowry from Powhatan? No. Was that not true? That was not true. I'm sorry. <laughs> because I'm sorry. John those... Rolfe got the colony to Roger Discovery, remember, assign him that land. It was all done by the English. Powhatan had no part of that. It's an interesting spot. I yeah, it is. go down I like there it. quite a lot because between Jamestown and Smith's Fort, you control the entrance to the James River. So it seems to me that there's a lot more more evidence for her being a pawn in the whole discussion. And uh, back to the same old story with the same old result That's for American Indian it. people. Yeah. Uh, there's someone back Thank there that asked a question, wanted yeah. to ask a question. Um, I'm a historian affiliated with William and Mary, so this is maybe one of those splicing and dicing. And um, so the most recent interpretations I've heard of the Pocahontas saving John Smith story <laughs> is that actually this is a part of Powhatan's power play and trying to assert his authority over the Virginian colonists. So he sets up a scenario where John Smith is imperiled, but that both he, in concert with his daughter, are both saving him and showing their power and their control and asserting themselves over the English colonists. Um, I'm wondering that's if that's an interpretation that resonates with the panelists there. I'm, I, I personally like it because it does give more agency to the indigenous people of Virginia, rather than just having John Smith kind of flatteringly say, you know, she's in love with me and that's why, you know, she saved me and, you know, the English are so great. So if you just have uh, comments basically in response to that. Any response from the panel? Yeah. You know, I find it more likely than the myth. Yeah, I've got no problem with that. 
they weren't making him run the gauntlet. Instead, they were putting him through something like that. Yes, I could, I could live with that very easily. That, that but, my challenge to that is that, you know, again, somebody else is making us smarter or, or less, less stupid or less whatever. I mean, obviously, um, Powhatan and his people knew the land intimately. Um, and were very versed in their own politics and the control of the land. So obviously there was a lot more going on, but to reconstruct it in a way that we, I mean, I could accept that, but at the same time, of course, there was, you know, they were brilliant um, and remain brilliant, um, but that's, you know, having to back the truck up and as if um, that wasn't where it started. If that makes any sense. I would say, as I understand, John Smith uh, had other writings where uh, the same general story happened in uh, Turkey uh, w when he was off fighting wars. So I'm sorry. Once, if he's using the same <laughs> story burned. on two different continents, mm. I'm not going to believe it. <laughs> I have another question back here. Yes, thanks. Um, I'm just, with all the interest in Pocahontas and in Powhatan culture that's emerging these days with lots of projects being done about Pocahontas, I'd love to hear, it's an open question, I'd love to hear from the panelists about what messages and what important things would you like to see done with that story in, in the future? The song remains the same. <laughs> That's a Led Zeppelin tune. <laughs> uh, it's a tough order to change the story after so many years. It, it's, it's, it's prevalent in American society. The only people that can talk about it uh, with relevance are folks that have studied it, like people on this panel who've understood it over the years, have experienced part of that over the years. But to change the story, that's like changing the story that George Washington threw a quarter across <laughs> the Rappahannock River. <laughs> it's hard to come by. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These myths are hard to, hard to defeat. If, if, I could, if I could say, um, as far as like museums like mine, like Henricus, and also our awesome friends at Jamestown who engage students every day. The, the, the kids that are coming up today are getting a, a much different perspective. And they're getting a, a very fair perspective and as objective as possible. Um, you know, at my site, we have a heavily attended school program called The Two Lives of Pocahontas, and it's booked regularly, uh, as well as our other program, which is, um, the, which is a basic Palatine Indian program. And so those, those children are coming away with uh, something that perhaps the generation before did not. So yeah. I would also like to suggest that Native people tell our story, tell her story. If there's any way to tell the story differently is to let the um, indigenous people of Virginia reframe the story, tell the story. Because one of the things that, I mean, I really appreciate all of the academic study and all of those kinds of things. But we have to live in this time and mm -hmm. getting and funding. I mean, part of that is getting the ability for Native people to tell their story and funding to have those, whatever it's movies or however it's reframed, it needs to come from a Native voice um, so that it really has all of the texture and life of the people of this state. So. You know, there's one thing that came out of that Disney movie that <laughs> folks didn't embrace, but it's a truth that some people don't like to swallow. In that song, it says, you think you own whatever land you land on. I mean, that's true. And, and I'll hear people talk about, well, this land has been in my family since 1614, since 1634. And, and guess who gave it to them? Well, they stole it from, right. I mean, and how could he do that? And, and, and so we're rewarded by them changed the name of the Powhatan River to the James River, some nondescript king that all of a sudden had license to steal the land. And then we convene the legislature and we start rules of law that's heralded, you know, the, the land title ownership. All of a sudden that became 
popular and as much heralded, but there was no title transfer, no deed to us when the land was taken. So there are some things you can take out of that movie and ponder. And, and when you talk about <laughs> how the United States was founded on Christian principles, you can debunk that myth. You have my permission to do that. <laughs> I think, though, that it's not only within the USA that um, there needs to be more education. I think that it can be a basis for international cooperation, Absolutely. encouraging young people, certainly in England and here, to be able to talk to one another and share some of these things around that story and to be able to take that forwards. And Chief Steve, as you spoke about that, so many people that are non-native don't have the respect that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. They don't understand it in that way. And when we speak about it, we speak about it from a traditional culture that we live in and understand. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be different when we speak about it than it will be for anyone else that speaks exactly. about it. Very well said. I have three people over here and one over here. I'm going to take the one in the... I'm sorry. One's we can't see. We can't see. So uh, uh, my name is Martin Sandig. I'm the uh, assistant site supervisor over at Jamestown and the actual Palatine site. Um, I have a question on how we square the story of Pocahontas' conversion to Christianity with the facts surrounding that the Powhatan burn a Jesuit mission to the ground and kill the Jesuit priests in the 1570s, that women, English women who are captured by the Powhatan are reluctant to return to a subservient or less authoritative role than that what they are gaining in Powhatan society by returning to their English roots. How does Pocahontas, or how do we square this narrative that Pocahontas, a Powhatan woman who would traditionally have far more authority in her own life and life choices, um, voluntarily takes on a role and takes on a lifestyle which strips her of those benefits? Maybe we don't. I don't think that uh, transition was voluntary. Uh, after all, she was held in captivity for several years. She might have been volunteering to help some of the British at one time. Maybe that was the nature of the Powhatan people with her to help the British in certain ways. Uh, but as far as uh, volunteering uh, to be sent to Henricus and later on marry John Smith, it could have been part of that know. Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, I'm sorry, John. See, I'm getting it too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I wouldn't say it was all voluntary, but uh, I don't know if there are any other comments on that. Other, other, speak, other guests? Mark, would, Mark, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to have to ask the husband of one of our speakers, <laughs> Mark Gallagher. <laughs> Mark, would you stand, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, you're probably not, or, or are just indirectly aware of the optics of this, but it's really thrilling to see a, a panel that is a majority Native people. Um, I'd like to thank the, ver th thank the mu museum for, for its choices. Um, but my, I, so I guess my question or whatever would be, um, I, so often, my experience is that people are happy to tell Indians the way they should do it, <laughs> or we've got a really good idea for y'all, um, but you have so much to offer and rarely a platform. So Pocahontas is, is obviously an open door. Are there others so th for people to find out that natives have perspectives and wisdoms and things to offer? Um, the greater population and should be valued for that? You know, I, I can't answer that completely, but I know we have friends here, uh, you know, Jamie Boscat is one of those who, in fact, welcomes this kind, of, this kind of exchange. So we know we have a place here if we bring subject matter to him 
that he would consider giving us a forum to air that. So as we move forward, especially here in this, in this area, uh, if we fail uh, to, to lift those up, it's our fault. Because, uh, and, and I won't impugn any predecessors, but I'll tell you, it, it, uh, Jamie is it, it just a breath of fresh air here in his willingness to uh, have the story told, regardless uh, of who it might offend or who it might please. In his view, history is history, truth is truth. And I would like to comment that so much of our history here in Virginia has been held hostage. It's been covered over and ignored because politically, no one wanted to talk about us. We were supposed to be dead. We were supposed to have been eradicated in the 1600s mm -hmm. because now you're sitting on our land. And so now they don't want anyone to know that we exist anymore. Now we exist, and we know you're sitting on our land, and it's okay. <laughs> Let's move on. You know, there's much more to learn exactly. from each other. We have existed on this land for thousands of years, and we have generational knowledge that can benefit all of society, mm -hmm. if they would only listen. But it's been suppressed all these years. So now is an opportunity for the tribes to bring some of that traditional knowledge out to the public so that it can benefit all of mankind. And the public wants to hear. People do not want to be ignorant of their history. Yes, sir. One more question back here. I was so excited when I found out, I guess it was last year, that a committee had been formed to place statues of famous women in Virginia. And I thought, I know who the first statue is going to be. Pocahontas. No, it's not Pocahontas. But the Pamunkey tribe had a chief. And I have it here in my little book, but I can't pronounce her name. That She was the first female chief. And she is going to represent, I believe, the, uh, one of the famous, most famous women in Virginia. Um, Excellent. Can you pronounce her name for me? Anybody? I have the same problem. Uh, <laughs> I, Coca, Coca, S, Coca, O, S, K. Um, I almost have to say it. Coca, Coca, O, S, K. Yeah. Thank you. If I see it, I That's can pronounce I it. Thank you. Everything wrong. Well, people have a hard time pr pronouncing Powhatan, so don't don't feel bad. <laughs> One question over yes, here. One question and comment. Um, it's about the Disney depiction of Pocahontas. I must admit, I didn't see the movie. I didn't want to see it. Um, and some years ago, I did an analysis of Disney movies that I grew up watching and the crazy sexism and stereotyping and all of the, you know, fairy tales, basically. But, um, and I haven't kept up completely, but I did just notice that since Disney has made 33 animated movies, Pocahontas is the only one of an historical character. They're, the rest of them are completely made up, but look what they did with their one historical character. Mm. Uh, it's just strange, isn't it? It is. It's, it's actually sad. And, and is there no, well, I guess there are all these laws and that they could use her name, her sort of story and image without permission. Uh, I don't know. We have a question back here. I, right I, I can follow up on, on that when we did our first show and, and, and the I'm book sorry. I mentioned earlier about Pocahontas in 1995. Um, I, I talked to the Disney people because we had to mention it in the book. And I said, well, you're here because it's the anniversary of her birth. And they said, it is? <laughs> <laughs> so the history wasn't of any interest. or They didn't know that. It's one person behind the lady in red. I'm sorry. What? What was the religion of the Polka, the Powhatan people? Well, the Chickahominy. I've heard, I've heard you all talk had about the uh, religion the with uh, the Pahone and Okeas. It may be, then I think we have all, all had the same, but, but we had what, what the uh, invaders called, you know, we were polytheistic, but we, 
we had the good God and the bad God, Ochias and Ahon, which is kind of tantamount to the Judeo-Christian tradition that's been in the United States all these many years. So it, it wasn't that far afield of Christianity. So. Okay, I have to interrupt. Uh, I'm sorry, I had a gentleman over here. He is a, actually a minister, so he can help us with this. <laughs> 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 John, you had a question. Well, I was uh, reflecting on, uh, on Steve's comment um, about the, the land and where the land come from. And I think one of the things that, that happens is um, part of the white European ancestry here is the minute you start reminding folks is the question of reparations. Mm you know, the, the question of, of guilt and burden that begins to be carried. And um, I don't think our side has figured out how to deal with that yet. Mm. I think there's uh, the offer, I hear the offer of forgiveness and, and we're past that, long past that. But um, I, I don't think my shade of the spectrum has caught up with that or knows how to receive it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would welcome any kind of insight mm. that uh, anyone on the panel might have. You know, we were told, uh, Indians were told at large that by lots of uh, legislators that uh, treaties are passe. We don't need treaties anymore. So, uh, you know, this is one time I think there was un unanimity among the tribes. We said, well, okay, forego the treaties. We'll give you the 2% of land that you gave us, and we'll take the 98%. Treat as null and void. <laughs> so I don't think we'll ever get resolution to that. <laughs> uh, there are some other folks over here that are looking to ask a question. I think the lady in red. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about the tribal structure um, between Powhatan and Opekakanu. Um, I'd heard some allusions to uh, Powhatan having been a war chief at one time before he became the paramount chief and the Apeka Canoe, um, and the paramount chief being a peace chief and Apeka Canoe coming along behind him and assuming the role of the war chief. Helen has probably written mm -hmm. more about that subject than anyone. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I often get that sort of question because people have read about war chiefs and peace chiefs farther down to the southeast, the Creeks, for instance. There doesn't seem to have been that rigid mm -mm. a division between the two because the paramount chief and also the district chiefs did, in fact, function as both. Mm -hmm. They had to do different jobs at different times. Like the rest of us, you play different roles. Um, so if in any given district, you're going to have one major chief and satellite towns, for instance, and often that chief's brothers and sisters would be heading up the satellite towns. And later, if they outlived the chief, they would move up. And the same thing could happen on the paramount chiefdom level. They might move up if they are. For instance, if the Kikitans were taken over in about 1596, about the time of Pocahontas's birth taken over. They had not wanted to join Powhatan's outfit, and he placed one of his sons as the new chief and also replaced most of the people, and the Kikitans were taken off into some other part of his domains and watched for a good long while. I don't know if that helps you with the structure. Uh, the quickest way to get out in a popularized form, I do occasionally write a popularized book nowadays, <laughs> and it's the Pocahontas Powhatan Obichan Kano book. And I introduce the characters, all three of the characters, and then I focus for a while on what their relationship was one to another, especially Powhatan and Opechangano. Paramount chief, eventual successor. But separating war and peace, I have not found evidence, let's say it that way, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. that right. there was a separation of people, a separation of roles over time. Yes. Does that help? We have time for two more questions. Here. Uh, yes. Did uh, Pocahontas's son ever reconnect with her people? Yes. He came over in the year 1640. And in 1641, he is known to have gotten the governor's permission, which was necessary at the time, to go and visit his uncle, Opechangano, and his aunt, 
the bolderized name came out Cleopatra. I'm sure it was something else. But he was given permission to visit them. How many visits altogether he made before the next war really got going, I don't know. Hmm. But yes, he did visit them. Um, her, her question kind of went to what my question is. Given the perception of from the English of the Native Americans as savages and whatnot, how was she received when she went to England um, with the other high society, you know, English people, the royal family? Was she treated as more of a novelty or was she actually respected as, you know, a fellow Christian or? Good question. I'm gonna ask Chris Stone if he would. Uh, as far as I know, she was received as royalty and she was a princess in her own right. And so that was the reason I think um, that she was received at court and also in her burial, she was buried, it said, in a place of honor because it says in the register of St. George's Church that she was buried in the chancel of the church, which is the place of honor in the church for any particular burial. And so from those couple of things, I think that gives us an idea that she was well received at court. And I'm sure there are probably other documents as well that, that support that. Thank you. There's someone right in this area that wanted to ask a question. <laughs> and this will be our last question of the evening. Uh, uh, one more, she says, one more. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. I would like to speak to your point about the, uh, the land. And I might say, I'm from Gloucester, Virginia. My grandfather grew up in Wacomico, Virginia, which is where Wacomico. And uh, I just want to make the point that now, where across the York River, all of that land, who owns that land now? The federal government, I think. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about Navy Mine Depot, we're talking about Cheetah Man X and all that sort of thing. And now, so much of that land is owned by the federal government. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I could talk about, <laughs> if, if you had time, I could elaborate on it for several days, but, uh, <laughs> you know, when, when, when uh, the government says, we're here to help, <laughs> they help themselves. I think we have one more question in this area. Uh, and I think we're going to... One in the one in the back, and I think we can't. And then we'll get to you after this question, nope. and I think we'll have to call it an evening with the questions. But uh, please feel free to talk to the individual panelists after the meeting if you'd like to ask some spe specific questions. And before Alan says anything, Alan really worked hard behind the scenes to help today come to fruition. Mine, mine is not a question, it's uh, a little um, example of the difference the way the Virginia Indians are regarded in England as they are here in Virginia. Yeah. I had the great privilege of accompanying Chief Ann and Chief Ken and Chief Steve uh, two years ago uh, to England for the commemoration and honoring of Pocahontas at the 400th anniversary. And one of those ceremonies was at a palace, a private palace, Zion House, be Duke of Northumberland's home, the, to the Percy family, they were patrons of the uh, Virginia Company. And it was on the grounds of this palace that Pocahontas and John Rolfe had a house. He gave them a house to stay in because the London air was very polluted and she was having troubles. And so that's the last house they lived in before getting on the boat and going on down the Thames to go back to Virginia. And so they wanted to put a plaque where this house had stood, it's long gone. And unfortunately, the location of it is now an industrial estate. Um, and for health and safety reasons, the whole crowd couldn't go there. So only the principals were invited for the unveiling of this plaque. Um, and we were greatly honored because His Royal Highness, the Duke of Gloucester, uh, was the royal that was there to uh, un uh, pull the curtain and unveil the plaque. and. Um, after the unveiling of it, only royalty rides in, if you've ever watched royal weddings and all these things, only royalty rides in a carriage. The only people that were in the carriage that came back to Zion House were His Royal Highness and our royalty, the three chiefs. And when they arrived, the Duke of Gloucester 
as the junior royal got out of the carriage first and then assisted Chief Anne out of the carriage, followed by Chief Ken and Chief Steve. And then he stood and he bowed his head as protocol requires acknowledging visiting royalty. She speaks the truth, I was there. <laughs> Have a lively crowd. <laughs> Someone in the back? Someone in the rear is wanting to ask a question? Okay. It's okay? It's okay. Uh, all right. Wait, there's a mic. Wait, wait, wait. I think they have a mic. We got it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you were talking about matrilineal society, that women could be chief. What do we know about women as warriors? If they were chief, would they have been warriors? Would they have counsel? Any of their counsel have been women? Uh, I'll answer one. I'll answer one. Um, not too far from here, uh, Sir Thomas Dale is going to uh, combat, um, I'll probably say her name terribly, uh, Apostle Kwinuski, who was um, the queen of the Appomattox, uh, the Appomattox River today. And um, she had one uh, village or town, uh, and her brother had another. and. Um, she was actually um, shot in combat by the English. Um, but she had before that actually laid an ambush for um, English that were um, charting up the James. Um, she apparently lured the English to shore, uh, uh, attacked them, and uh, Sir Thomas Dowes will be the only one that survived to tell the tale of that. Um, and it's quite feasible that they, they came after her because of that. So that's just one example anyway. Very good, thank you. Andy, I think. Uh I think the end of our Q&A session has, has come. Yes. Well, I, I think you'll all agree that this has been really a remarkable afternoon. Um, and I want to thank all of our panelists for participating in today's program. And I don't think that this would have been quite as uh, wonderful without the engagement of this audience. So I think that you all deserve a round of applause. And I think this group deserves a round of applause as well. I'd also like to uh, just one more time thank our friends at the 2019 Commemoration American Evolution for their support of this program. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that what we've learned today, uh, among other things, is that the story of Pocahontas has been told many times by many people over the past four centuries. Um, and today it was important that we come together to talk about that narrative from multiple perspectives that all too often in the past have either been underrepresented or misrepresented. You know, our understanding of history doesn't come to us preformed, um, but our knowledge of it evolves. And Pocahontas has been at the center of conversations for more than four centuries. And I think that it's important that at places like the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, we come together to regularly reevaluate our understanding through conversations like these. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite everyone uh, to join us in our lobby for some refreshments and to continue the amazing conversation that has ha been happening here this afternoon. So thank you all very much. I hope you have a good rest of your evening. <laughs>